So welcome to you all. My name is Keith. I'm one of the pastors here at Stonebridge, and welcome to you who are at home joining us as well. I'm excited to be able to lead us through Galatians chapter 4, verses 8 through 20 this morning. But I want to start by asking, um, have you ever had a relationship with someone in which they started well and then got off track somewhere down the road? Do you know someone who maybe started with Jesus or a profession of faith or even someone in, who in your youth, um, you know, professed faith in Jesus Christ and at some point has wandered off track or completely abandoned the faith? I know I have. It's disappointing, right? When you, when you see someone who starts well and then doesn't stay on that path, it's really discouraging. And I can tell you that as someone who has <clears throat> really professionally worked with teenagers for about 15 or 16 years, the percentage of students that I've worked with that professed faith in Christ when they were in middle school or high school who are still actively walking with Jesus Christ is very small. I, I would, if I had to put a percentage to it, I'd say something like 20 to 30 percent. That's pretty discouraging. <laughs> it's pretty discouraging. And many of us have encountered that in some way, shape, or form. I know that there are uh, parents of adult children who have children who started well and have wandered away, and it's hard, right? It's hard to watch somebody who starts well um, sort of get off track, right? Somebody who starts on the path with God to kind of get off on their own path. And this is what we see in this passage of Scripture, that Paul, the Apostle Paul, uh, really cares about those who he has ministered to, not only in their conversion, but he really cares that people stay on God's path. But unfortunately, what we've seen in the book of Galatians is there are a group of people, these Judaizers, who sort of fancy themselves as like super apostles, who have a better plan for these Christian converts, these converts who were uh, Greek, who had turned from the worship of this pantheon of gods to faith in Jesus Christ, but now these Judaizers want to say, no, no, that's not enough. Now what you have to do is in addition to your faith in Jesus Christ, now you have to take all the distinctively Jewish elements of observances of days and seasons and times and circumcision and all the rites that come along with these things, and in order for you to really, really have a relationship with God, you got to do all that. And evidently, it was working on them. Because at this point in the book of Galatians, what we see Paul doing is making an impassioned plea, right? This is the moment where, I don't know if you've ever had this moment with someone, maybe it's a student or, or one of your own kids, or maybe your parent had it with you where they're like, okay, what are we doing here? Which way are you going? What are you going to decide? You're going this way, you're going this way, but you got to pick something, right? If you're going to be stupid, be all the way stupid, but be something, right? Make, a, make this decision, make this decision, but you can't just keep sort of waffling between the two. And so what Paul is actually doing in this passage of Scripture that we see here in verses 8 through 20 is he's basically saying, are you, are you taking your own path to get to God, or are you taking God's prescribed path for you through Jesus Christ? Is it your path or is it God's path? But we need to land on this somewhere. Because up to this point, in trying to combat the ideas of the Judaizers in, in the letter to the Galatians, Paul has spoken of his own conversion, of the power of the Holy Spirit, and he's spoken about history and theology, trying to give a framework for saying, look, what you're being told is good for you or is necessary for you to have a relationship with God or to sustain your relationship with God is wrong. They're lying to you. That's why in the very beginning of the book, Paul says, if anyone presents to you anything other than what you've already heard as the gospel, let that person be completely cut off because it's wrong. It's not true. And so what Paul is trying to get them to is to consider where are they headed and is it according to what is actually God's plan for salvation? Okay? And so what we're going to see in this passage are two things, and I want us to be mindful of two things as we read through this. Sometimes when we come to a passage of Scripture, it's very clear that we can look at it and take away an application that's like, oh, this, this is what I need to pay attention to. 
But some passages of Scripture are a little bit tricky because this passage, it's really more about Paul's heart for the Galatians, right? And, and as a pastor, as a shepherd, as a discipler, it's really more about how does Paul go about trying to encourage them and turn them back to faithfulness to Jesus Christ. But we're going to look at both aspects. We're going to look and say, well, where do I fall into the possible error of the Galatians? But also, how is Paul put forth as an example of discipling others? Because if you are a believer here today or watching at home with us today, if you're a believer, okay, you don't get the option of discipling others. Last time I checked, Jesus' words to his followers were, go therefore, right, make disciples of all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey all that I've commanded you. Nobody gets out of that, right? Nobody's a second-class citizen in the kingdom of God, and we don't get to just say, hey, that's not me. Every, everyone has someone whom God has put in their life, if it's your child, if it's your spouse, if it's a friend, if it's a neighbor, everyone has someone who God is saying, hey, lead this person, point this person to Jesus. And so we're going to look at it from two different perspectives this morning. So I hope you'll join me in that. But these two paths that, that Paul is laying out here in verses 8 through 20 are very distinctive. And the first path, which is the path that these Galatians had sort of stumbled onto because of this false teaching, is the practical path of earthly effort right? The practical path of effort. It, it seems like, well, it's something I can do, and it's something that I should do. It's tangible, right? So, the Judaizers were saying to uh, these Christians who had been converted from Greco-Roman, like, idol worship, now they were saying, well, no, you didn't go far enough. Now you need to observe all that you need to observe the Sabbath the way that it should be observed, <clears throat> You need to do all the festivals that we do. You need to be circumcised. And so you have to take on a, a Jewish flavor to your faith in Jesus Christ. This is what they were attempting to do. They were trying to give them a list of things that they could do to perfect their relationship with God, and Paul is not having any of it. He's like, this, this is not how this works. It's not how any of this works. But it draws us to this reality in verse 8. Look here with me. Formerly, when you did not know God the one true God, capital G, you were enslaved to those that by nature are not God's, lowercase g. What does this show us? Well, first of all, it shows us that all people are ultimately religious. Everybody's religious, right? Maybe not in the, in the way that they practice some sort of formalized religion, but everybody is religious in that they are somewhat superstitious, right? And they feel like there's some way they can hack the system and make their life better by doing something and then receiving something from what they're doing, right? Because really, the, the core of sort of plain level religion is if I do this for this deity or for this force, then that has to reciprocate. So as long as I can follow the path that's laid out before me, then I will achieve X goal, right? Like if I do all the things that I'm supposed to do, then this is the results I get. And this is what they were being told. Hey, here's, God is going to be pleased with you if, with Christ, you do all the things that God told his people to do in the Old Testament. You got to do all those things too. You can't just take Christ, you got to take it all. And Paul was actually disagreeing with this. He says, look, when you didn't know God, you were enslaved to those that by nature are not gods. Well, what does he mean by that? Well, obviously, anybody, if you know anything about Greek mythology, they worshipped a pantheon of gods. So, like, you had Zeus, right? You had Athena. You had um, Hephaestus, right? And throw out another name. Come on, Percy Jackson people, where are you at? Poseidon, there we go, good. Yeah, all these gods, and you had to hedge your bets with all these gods. If you act in this way, if you give them sacrifice, uh, if you go to this oracle and present your gifts to that god, then that god has a certain function, right? Like if, if there's a god of the harvest, the god of the harvest, if you give them, then they, you have crops because you offer a sacrifice. Does that make sense? That's how they operated. You were enslaved to those that by nature were not gods. So what Paul is saying, like, look, you you gave homage and reverence to something that wasn't even able to accomplish what you would hope they would accomplish, not God's. Now, at sort of like at first glance, it appears that Paul is saying like, hey, those aren't even real. 
That's not really what Paul is saying. Paul is actually saying that not only are they not gods, but they're driven by demonic forces. So Paul makes an emphasis to say, what you're doing, you're not just enslaved to a pattern, you're actually enslaved to your enemy, right? To Satan, to demonic forces who are actually in opposition to the one true God. You were enslaved. The natural state of people who have rejected God <clears throat> is to continually look for purpose and meaning in religion. That's just true. Like even people who are like, I'm an atheist, I don't believe in God. They're still religious because they're devoted to a set of principles that they think if they accomplish all those things that they're devoted to, their life is going to be better than someone else's. Agreed? It's still religion. There's tremendous religious devotion even to, like, settled science. That's a big popular phrase now, right? Well, it's settled science, right? But we know that what is settled science oftentimes is disputed science. So it's not that simple. It's not it's not as simple enough to say, well, you know, there are certain people who don't believe in any God and don't practice any religion. People, by nature, are religious. We want to hack the system. We want to find a way to appease whatever God we worship, right, even if that God is the universe itself, and get out of it what we want, what we desire. But Paul says that's actually slavery. You're enslaved to a system that has you constantly performing, 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 but you're not actually getting out of it what you hoped you would get, right? So Paul is reminding them that they were delivered from ignorance, but they weren't delivered from ignorance because they were smart enough to find their way out. It's not like they stumbled upon a better religion, right? Look at verse 9. Now that you have come to know God or rather to be known by God, how can you turn back again to the weak and worthless elementary principles of the world whose slaves you want to be once more? Weak and worthless elementary principles. What are weak and worthless elementary principles? Well, honestly, it's like, if I do this, then this has to happen, right? It's the cause effect. That's an, a weak, worthless elementary principle because you know, as well as I do, that you can do a lot of good stuff and it ends up bad for you. Agreed? You've experienced that before. Just because you do X doesn't mean that it's going to result in you automatically receiving a benefit from that. Thinking that your action is automatically going to make your life better in some way, shape, or form, or that if you appease this God or appease this person, that that means you've developed a system where everything turns out great, that is not possible. It's weak and it's worthless because you can't control all the other circumstances around you. Agreed? It's why, like, a lot of the self-help stuff falls short is because those books will tell you, hey, if you'll just do this, this is what you're going to get. But you know as well as I do, if you've ever tried any sort of diet or exercise plan, it fizzles out because the, the pictures that you see don't end up what you look like. Right? <laughs> it doesn't work that way. It's weak and it's worthless because there's no way in saying, if you'll just do this, this is what has to happen right? There's no way to do that. Paul says you were enslaved to that type of thinking. It's immature thinking. It's ungodly thinking. But the other thing that he says that's really interesting is he said, now that you've come to know God, or, or rather, to be known by God, right? And that's the clincher. He doesn't say, hey, you're so smart that you found the actual way to get around all the weak and worthless things. What he says is, you were sought out by God, right? You didn't find him. He found you, right? You've come to know him. Oh, wait a minute. Rather, you've come to be known by him. See, once God knows you, everything changes. And what you know about God doesn't really change anything. It's whether or not God knows you. Because a lot of people have information about God that doesn't really change anything in their life. They might think that it does, Right? But once God knows you, as we saw in the last text last week when we talked about being adopted into the family of God, being a son or daughter in Christ, once you have become God's, right, then everything changes. Paul reminds them it wasn't their own ability or activity that courted God's attention. And there was nothing that they had done or could do to come into relationship with God. Right? Because if there was, that would still be religious activity that was courting God's attention, right? If there was something that I could do or find that led me to a deeper knowledge, then I get to claim that I'm smarter than the people around me, right? I'm, no, I'm not like those pagans. 
who couldn't find Jesus, I found Jesus. And Paul's correcting a really important part of theology, which is you don't go looking for God, God comes looking for you. Our lives aren't changed because of anything that we've done to secure his favor. Our lives are changed because Christ comes to us and says, hey, the kingdom is at hand, repent and believe the gospel. Being a Christian isn't primarily about what you know, but about who you know. And I'll go farther. Not who you know, but who knows you. That's why it's interesting that Jesus, when he tells the parable of the sheep and the goats, doesn't say, hey, go away from me. You don't know me. He says, depart from me, workers of iniquity. I don't know you, even though they have a a resume of a ministry. They're like, hey, we cast out demons. Hey, we did this. We did this. Jesus is like, wonderful. None of that works. I don't, I don't know you. This is what Paul's trying to bring the Galatians back to. Look, don't forget, you never secured your salvation in the first place. How could you perfect it? Right? If, if we don't save ourselves, if we can't secure our salvation, how in the world could we perfect our salvation? It doesn't make sense that what started in the Spirit is finished in the flesh, right? Scripture tells us that. We can't, we can't do that. That's a bad path, right? Trying to return to my way of getting to God is, is not going to work. And that's what Paul's trying to get them to see how silly this is. Why would you want to go back to a life of enslavement once you've experienced relationship? Right? Why would you want to be enslaved to weak, worthless principles once you know the God of the universe? It doesn't make any sense. Right? It's preposterous. Paul implies that these converts adopting Judaism would be no different than the paganism they were converted from. It's all superstitious action. It's all weak. It's all worthless. It's all elementary, right? It's still these, these Christians who had trusted in Christ trying to add to their salvation, oh, now I've got to do all these things for God. Paul's like, that's weak and it's worthless because that's, that's you trying to perfect or secure what you never achieved in the first place. It doesn't make any sense, and it doesn't work that way. He's warning them they're getting pulled back into exactly what they had been saved from. Look at verse 10, chapter 4, verse 10. You observe days and months and seasons and years. And what he's talking about there is those observances of the Jewish calendar, right? Like you do the festivals, um, you do all the celebrations, you observe the new moons, and you observe the Sabbath, right? And all these Sabbath regulations, you've got to do all that stuff, right? And at face value, it looks like, well, maybe we should do that stuff because if it's in the Bible, maybe we should do it. Paul actually tells them, right, that if they go back to that, they're actually doing the same thing that they were saved out of. And this might get confusing for us because it does bring up the question, wait a minute, if God didn't, if God doesn't really want people to do those things, then why are they in the Bible in the first place? Why did God at one point in time say, hey, you need to observe these things, you need to do these things, you need to be circumcised? Why did God do that? Well, the short answer is this. Christ is the fulfillment of everything that we see in the, New, in the Old Testament. The, the way in which God had prescribed that human beings would be able to get to God, we find that fulfillment in Christ Jesus. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me, right? See, in the Old Testament, the author of Hebrews would say that everything we see in the Old Testament is a shadow of the substance which we find in Christ, okay? It's not that God wasn't serious about holiness, but here's the deal. What we see in the Old Testament is even if God tells you exactly what you have to do to be pleasing to God, you can't do it, and I can't do it. That's really discouraging. Do you agree that human beings are so beset with sin that even when God gives us a list of all the things that we would have to do to be pure in his eyes, we can't hit it. And in fact, once God's representative walks up the mountain, we're all building a golden calf like five minutes after we think God's not watching us. You can't do it. But we desire to have some sort of system in which we can still do what we want and we can still give in to the desires of our heart, but yet if we have this system, then we can please God with the stuff that we do, right? Hacking the system. It's why a lot of young people, right, churched young people, okay, so if you're here and you're a church young person, this is what we fall into because I did it too and your parents probably did it too if they grew up in church. We tend to think that if we 
if we proclaim faith in Christ, right, and we go to church and we do what our parents want us to do, we can kind of hack the system by not, like, God doesn't really care what we're doing when it's just us in our room or when it's just us with our friends. And as long as I go to church and say prayers and do what mom and dad want me to do, then I'm good with God. But see, that's, that's not hacking the system. That's actually not living in the truth of Jesus Christ. That's believing that you can somehow, like, trick God, reverse psychology God into thinking, like, oh, he's actually pretty good. And not admitting Hey, my heart is always leaning towards sin, and I always need to be drawn back to not what I can do for God to pay for it or to over, you know, overcome it, but what Christ has done for me. This is what Paul is trying to get them to see, right? And it's a, it's a scorching and a shocking statement for Paul to make to say that the Jewish observance of religion that attempted to add to or, or correctly take anything away from Christ is just as dead as the pagans erecting shrines and engaging in superstitious cult worship. Paul says, hey, now that Christ has been, been displayed, for you to go back to all those things that were meant to point to Christ would be no different than you just going ahead and worshiping Zeus anyway. What's the difference? What's the difference? But see, this is still happening today. Whether it's, it's honestly, and whether it's the trappings of something like Roman Catholicism, right, which still venerates saints as being on a whole nother level, which still says that even though Christ has accomplished on the cross what's necessary, that you still somehow have to like pay for what you've done, that there are things that you need to do in order to complete what Christ has already done, and then at the end of your life to be able to be like, well, I don't know that I've done enough to actually be okay with God, but I've given it my best shot. That's not hope, and that's not Christ. It's still active today. It could be this sort of modern cult of self where like a lot of Christians get sucked into like new age type practices thinking that we can add to our experience, right? The more that we know about ourselves and the more enlightened we are, the better experience that we're going to have. One of the things that I've been studying on recently is this thing called the Enneagram, right? Because I've heard a lot of people talk about it in Christianity, modern Christianity, and it's some, this personality test that's actually based on a nine-pointed star, which is this weird old alchemical symbol meant to like sort of uh, draw elements in from the universe. It's basically like an occult beginning that a lot of Christians are now using to figure out what type of personality they are so they can let everybody know, here's how God's designed me. But you see how that's kind of like skewed, right? You see how that's like, it doesn't seem bad, but it's a weak and worthless elementary principle. And it also does damage to, let me just, this is a, this is like a, I'm going to chase a rabbit here. Um, one of the things that is not gospel is the way that we even treat, like, making much of ourselves. Because if, if your value to God is what, based on what you can do or what you have to offer to God, then that means anybody who is disabled is, is either useless or way less useful than, than people who are not. And that is a hellish, demonic thing to say. Do you agree? Right? It would also do damage to those of us who are, you know, who, if we say that we're pro-life and that a baby is an image bearer of God, then that can't have anything to do with what that baby can accomplish because babies can't accomplish much in the womb. Does, Does that make sense? So this cult of personality that we build up as Christians where we start to primarily identify ourselves with how I'm uniquely designed and it's less about who Christ is and centering our lives all around Jesus, you see how it pulls us out into weak and worthless elementary principles where we're focusing more on actualizing our salvation through ourselves rather than trusting in Christ alone. It's so subtle, but it's so dangerous. Or it might be the legalism that I grew up in, which was a sort of a, a, a tricky, sneaky legalism, right? Where I just was always convinced that God was just really mad at me all the time <laughs> or mildly perturbed with me all the time because I was always doing stupid stuff. And so I always had to make sure that I did more things that would make God happy than make him sad until I finally realized through the joy of Reformed theology that there was nothing I could do to make God pleased with me in and of my own actions, and then finally got set free. 
when I was like 30 years old. (laughs) Free from believing that there was anything I could do to make God love me more than what he had already shown in Christ. And the reason Paul is so passionate about this is because he understands what's at stake here. Right? What's at stake here? Is the glorification of Christ and the health of these believers. Verse 11, Paul says, I'm afraid I may have labored over you in vain. Now, if you've ever had children or you've ever discipled anyone, you've said that in your head (laughs) at some point. Oh, what am I doing? Like, have I, all this, the work that I'm putting in, I, um, you know, have I just been spinning my wheels? And this is where Paul's at, which is nice to see Paul saying that, because isn't it nice to know that somebody who is so firm is a little bit sad as he's trying to disciple other people? Who of us involved in the discipling of others have ever felt this sentiment before? I'm afraid I may have labored over you in vain. I know I feel it about myself at least a couple times a week. (laughs) Maybe it's a loved one. Maybe it's a child who even made a profession of faith and might still make a profession but with no real fruit. Instead, maybe they've walked completely away from Jesus or they've put together some sort of pseudo-Christianity that is more kind of an amalgamation of various superstitions and misused scriptures than actual life in Christ. I don't know. I don't know if you have a relationship like that, but... I can tell you that we can learn a lot from Paul when you're encountering somebody who's trying to make their own way to God after they've heard the truth of Jesus Christ. It can be frustrating. But it is Paul's goal that they would get back on track with the actual path that God has provided, right? That instead of going their own way, they would choose to stay the course in following Jesus Christ. Paul was emphasizing that the Galatians were in danger of giving up all the wonderful privileges of true life in Christ. That's what's at stake. You know, real life versus enslavement. To go back to a false comfort driven by fear and seeking the approval of other people, specifically these super apostles, these Judaizers, right? Because it was intimidating to have these people show up and have all this great information because they didn't know much, right? They'd been converted from paganism to Christianity, but then the people who should have known the most, come to them and say, no, no, now you got to add this too. And now they're confused and it's easy for them to think, well, I mean, these people know what they're talking about. We should probably do what they're asking. We should probably live like they're telling us. And it seems easier to rely on superstitious practice. It seems easier. Again, honestly, who of us, if somebody showed up and said, hey, here's all the things you need to do to, to, to have a good life. I mean, wouldn't we be tempted to do that? I mean, even though we might know that that's not actually the way that it works, wouldn't you be tempted if somebody says, here's a list of all these things that you got to do on a weekly basis, and as long as you do these things, life's going to be great? You would be tempted to take it, and so would I. But Paul is like, that's weak, and that's worthless. And it's not really living. It's slavery, because what happens if you don't do one of those things that you're supposed to do? Because you'll forget at some point. Or what happens if you don't do it the right way? It's terrifying. There's no life in that. And so now Paul's going to talk about this second path, the path of, of God, okay, God's path for us, which is not, it's not a practical path, and it's not easy effort. It's a painful path of new birth. Right? The reality is choosing to go God's way is not easier, right? Like if somebody ever if you ever hear somebody say like, hey, once you, once you trust in Jesus Christ, life just gets better. <clears throat> no. I mean, yeah, from an eternal perspective and from a joy perspective and a fulfillment perspective, but if you think that life gets better when you trust in Christ, maybe check on any of the disciples. <laughs> maybe read Fox's Book of Martyrs. Right? Maybe look at the Reformation and how many people were burned at the stake. Wycliffe, who made the Bible translation, who made sure that we could understand it in English, right? Like, was burned for his work. So for us to think that, that there's a practical, easy you know, way for us to secure real life, Paul's like, hey guys, I know it's tempting to run over here and believe this stuff, but it's never going to bring you life. 
Paul was using his own life as an example. Look at verse 12. Brothers, I entreat you, become as I am, for I, has, I have become as you are. You did me no wrong. And so what Paul starts saying here is he, he's starting to appeal to their personal relationship. Paul's at the point now where he said, hey, if you go back, it's going to be weak and worthless. And now it's almost like he reaches that point where if, if you've ever tried to convince someone of something and then you start leaning into your relationship with them, you're like, hey, you know me. You know I wouldn't lie to you, right? You, you know you've, you've seen me. You've lived around me. You know that what I'm saying to you is absolutely genuine. This is what Paul is doing right now. It's an impassioned plea. He was using his own life as an example that real freedom in Christ is possible. I entreat you, become as I am, for I has be- I've become as you are. It's that concept that Paul used where he said, I've become all things to all people that by some means I might win some, right? Like, I will embed myself. I want to be in relationship with these people. I want to cry over them. I want to pray with them. I want to earnestly plea with them. He's identifying with them and saying, hey, look, now, since I became like you in order to share the gospel with you, now you need to become like me. You need to be focused on Jesus, right? I'm begging you. See these, see these things from my perspective. Look at this from my eyes. And he says, you, you did me no wrong. Look at verse 13. You know it was because of a bodily ailment that I preached the gospel to you at first. And so now he's going history. He's like, look, you did me no wrong. You, you received me. Right? You received me when I came to preach the gospel to you, and the whole reason I was in your midst is because I had this ailment. Now, we don't know for sure what it is. Many scholars think that it might be eyesight, an, an issue with eyesight, because of passages like Acts 22, um, and it, it may have something to do with Paul not being able to see well. I actually think it's more of a disfigurement. We know that Paul had a thorn in his flesh that he prayed to be removed, and each time God said, hey, my strength is, is sufficient for you. My grace is sufficient in your weakness, right? But Paul had some sort of disfigurement that should have caused them to to scorn him, right? A bodily ailment. So he's in he's in with the Galatians. He's there at Galatia because evidently, like I don't know if he needs treatment there or he ended up there. And so while he's there and he's recovering, he's preaching the gospel to them. And verse 14, though my condition was a trial to you, that's why I don't think it's just eyesight. I think it's probably something where it's like, I don't know if Paul just looked rough. Or he was rough to be around, but it it could have been a trial to them. It was not a trial to you. You did not scorn or despise me, but received me as an angel of God. Paul refers to their experience together and his own weakness to testify to the power of the gospel, right? Paul was afflicted, but he was reminding them of the joy that they received him with as he shared the gospel. In, in this day and time, the Greeks would have seen someone who was either disfigured or afflicted and automatically assumed one of two things. Remember, because weak and worthless elementary principles. If something is wrong with you, then what? You did something wrong, right? Or you're evil. So at this point, if the Greeks were to see somebody who's disfigured or uh, inhibited in some way, they would say, well, either the gods are mad at this person or this person has some sort of demon with them. And instead, Paul says, instead of like scorning me or spitting on me and despising me, instead of looking as a cause-effect relationship, like, oh, because he's afflicted, then he must have done something bad, the Galatians received him, right? These Galatian Christians received him, and he spoke the power of the gospel, right? It's similar to what Paul says in Corinthians when he tells the Corinthians, I determined to know nothing among you but Christ and him crucified, right? That's Everywhere that Paul went was Christ and him crucified. Paul wasn't concerned with getting the credit from other people, right? Because of what he had experienced, he wanted Christ to get all the attention, and he was willing to put himself aside and endure a lot to see Christ lifted up. And he says, you received me as an angel of God. Instead of receiving me as a demon, you received me as an angel of God, as Christ Jesus. Paul reminds them that the message of the gospel he was presented, he presented to them was so powerful that even though he was infirmed, even though he may have been disfigured or hindered, they were able to look at that without shrinking back and instead of receiving him as someone who is smitten or stricken or demonically afflicted, they received him in the same way as they would receive Christ himself. Now that says a lot, Right? that they would endure even the scorn of other people around them as they were converted and believed in the message of the gospel, that they wouldn't just kick Paul out. 
And he says not only that, in verse 15, he says, what then has become of your blessedness? Like, what, what happened to who you used to be? What happened to the bond that we used to have? I testify to you, if possible, you would have gouged out your eyes and given them to me. That's, that's, that's friendship. Paul says, look, you loved me so much, you believed in me so hardcore, that if I would have asked you for your eyeballs, you would have given them to me. This is another reason why scholars think, well, maybe it was eyesight, but I mean, that might be just one of those things where like, oh, I'd cut my arm off for my friend. I don't know if people say that. I know I've never said I'll, guide, I'll gouge my eyes out for you, so, and I've got some pretty good friendships. I wouldn't, I'm not, have I ever said that to you? No. So I've never even said that to my wife. I'd gouge my eyes out for you, babe. Uh, you might, if you lead off with that when you're dating, that's a little creepy. Um, you might be arrested. But that's a deep friendship, right? So Paul is calling them to consider the friendship that they have with him and how he has been faithful to them to provide them, right, with numerous reasons to believe in the power of the gospel message, right? Because it wasn't about him or how well he could present it. It reminds me of... Uh, the, the verse that says, faithful are the wounds of a friend. Look at six, verse 16. Have I then become your enemy by telling you the truth? So he's like, hey guys, we were cool because you saw me, you saw the gospel, right? You understood the message of the gospel as I preached it among you, but now am I your enemy because I'm telling you the truth? Like, because I'm calling you to God's path, now I'm not your friend? See, the thing that Paul always relied on, right, was the power of the message of the gospel. Paul needs to remind them of what they were saved from, and in doing so was running the risk of upsetting them. You ever told somebody the truth and they got mad at you? Right? Now, if you do it being a jerk, then you get no credit for that, right? But if you do that winsomely and kindly and people still don't want anything to do with you, then that's it's a hard thing to endure. But our nature is to react poorly, reject criticism and warning because it's a personal attack on my judgment, my autonomy, right? But Paul relied on the power of the message of the gospel. And this is one thing that we need to stop on right here with this. Paul was not relying on his own ability to, to convince them. Paul was not relying on his winsomeness because, in fact, Paul actually says again in, in Corinthians, he says, hey, I didn't come to you with flowery speech or words of wisdom. I came to you in, basically in weakness, and the power of the gospel did its thing, right? Paul was not interested in people thinking a lot of him. Paul was interested in people thinking a lot of Christ. And so he was definitively committed to preaching the word, which is what we should do as believers, committed to the word, not looking for external information, right? More information about God. If you find some sort of like devotional or journal that claims some sort of like extra biblical knowledge about who God is and stuff like that, you just need to put that thing where it belongs, in the trash can, it reminds me of when the book The Shack came out. People were like, man, that book helped me understand God so much more. And I was like, that's not God. That book doesn't talk about God. That book talks about somebody's perception of who they wished God would be in their mind. Right? Paul never did that. Paul was never concerned that they were receiving him because he wasn't presenting his own ideas. He was presenting the gospel. Ministers of the gospel will be evaluated by their faithfulness to the Word, right? As I stand up here to you, I'm evaluated by God right now, really, like on the merits of Christ. But my work here on earth is, needs to be put next to, am I faithful to the Word of God? Am I telling you guys a bunch of extra stuff that you need to go do that'll make your experience better? Or am I just giving you the pure Word of God? But, but newsflash, I'm not the only one responsible to do that. All believers are. We should just give what God has told us to give, right? To point to the truth of the gospel and to trust in its power. We don't need extra methodology to make Christianity better. The way I see it, I mean, you know, the God of the universe taking on flesh, walking the perfect life, dying on a cross for our sins, being raised to newness of life, and then being able to save us from our sin and give us an eternity with him, I think you can improve upon that. <laughs> I happen to think that's like the best news in the world, why would we think that we can ever find a better path to God than that? And note the difference between Paul and the false teachers. Verse 17, they make much of you, but for no good purpose. They want to shut you out that you may make much of them. Flattering is usually for the purpose of you serving the flatterer, right? These super apostles, they weren't in engaging with these people on the same level as Paul was. They were saying like nice things to them and trying to encourage them 
uh, to, hey, hey, this is going to be great for you, and oh, you guys are so sm- you are so much smarter than all the other people who won't do these things, right? You see how flattery works. Flattery is usually usually for the purpose of serving the flatterer, not them actually caring about you. And that's this is how religious schemes work. If you want to know something that's like fake or like cultish, is building up somebody, right? Saying really nice things about that person and what they can be right? And then you separate them and say, all those people who are telling you that other stuff, that, that pure stuff, who's just saying, oh, all you need is this, they don't know what they're talking about, and they're like, they're, they're hurting you, right? So you demonize the truth tellers. You speak flattery to win them over uh, to your position. This is exactly how cults work, right? So if you ever hear a presentation of the gospel that is more about how great you are, that's actually flattery, and that is not ever going to bring you closer to Christ, Does that make sense? It's so tricky, right? So tricky, but it's weak and worthless. I want to take this moment to say this, though. As we look at this, again, we're not just thinking, like, what is the path that Paul's talking about? We're asking, as a person who disciples other people and who is called to disciple other people, what are we called to do? I I will tell you that right now, I, I look at our landscape of young people, and I think the church has done just that we we have not responded well in discipling emerging generations. We have to do better because our young people right now are being sucked in all sorts of weak, worthless principles, thinking that, that they can somehow, you know, either add to salvation in Christ or that, like, exclusivity of Christ is not even necessary at all, right? They're stolen out from under us by charlatans who peddle lies about the origins of the universe, about the nature of humans and the value of life, about the truth of gender and sexuality, all because they draw them away from the gospel to weak and worthless elementary principles. And what doesn't help is pseudo-Christian teaching that makes you the center of everything and God is a means to wish fulfillment. If the gospel that you're living by is what, like, how, how am I going to, you know, have my best life? That's not the gospel. And Paul says in verse 18, hey, it's always good to be made much of for a good purpose. It's a good thing to be made much of if if the purpose is good. If being made much of is all about what Christ has done in you, great. If it's about all how great you are, not great. If you have kids, the best thing that you can do for your kids is not tell them how great they are, but to affirm them in what God is doing in them or what God wants to do in them. Because when we build each other up on the basis of our own abilities, we're driving each other right back into thinking that we can somehow win God's favor if we perform enough. If you tell a kid for years, you're so great at this, you're so great at this, you're so great at this, one of two things is gonna happen. Either they're gonna lose that ability or find someone who's better and their whole world's gonna come crashing down on them, or they'll go through their whole life believing that God owes them something because they're so great. Both are demonic and destructive. And it's created the world that we have in which people can't even understand why their opinion is not the most important opinion. And today we have false teachers of a different kind of legalism, a woke legalism, where it's now a requirement to take on zeal for social issues, not according to scriptural principles, but according to the new morality of activism, equity, and critical theory. And you'll never meet that standard, right? We've seen it happen. There's no salvation available that's secure. Once you make a mistake, you're done. Aren't you glad God doesn't work that way? I'd have been canceled a long time ago. But Christ, as Paul would say, has canceled our debt and disarmed rulers and authorities and nailed what we owed to the cross. We don't perform for God. Christ performed on our behalf. Verses 19 and 20, Paul says, My little children, for whom I am again in the anguish of childbirth until Christ is formed in you, I wish I could be present with you now and change my tone, for I am perplexed. This was hard for Paul. It's, it's painful that he's trying to convince them to go God's way instead of their own path. It's almost as though he has to walk them through the conversion process all over again. See, the Judaizers wanted to see themselves formed in their converts. They just wanted to make little thems. They wanted everybody else to walk around and parrot their ideas and then give them credit for their ideas so that ultimately they would be the ones who looked good, which is what all false teachers do. They build up their own brand and then get mad at people when they get called out. That's why we have so many evangelical mega pastors that are constantly falling left and right because they're not really in the business of building up Christ. They're in the business of building up themselves, right? 
That's what the Judaizers were doing. They wanted to validate their own ministry and influence. Paul was only interested in seeing through the formation of Christ in those he ministered to. Do you get the difference? Paul's like, I don't care if you like me or not. I want to see Christ formed in you. If that means hard conversations, let's have it. If, whatever I got to do to show you I'm serious about this, I want to see Jesus formed in you because that's the only way you'll ever experience true life is that Christ would be formed. This is an example of an emotional appeal from Paul, the appeal of a parent desperate for their children to return to the Lord. Paul says, I am in anguish as childbirth, which is weird because Paul's a dude, so he doesn't know what that's like, really. But dudes in here, you can imagine. Maybe you can't imagine. Maybe ask a woman who's had a baby and she'll tell you how arduous it is and then we'll have some complaint about how it can't be that bad. And Let's just not get into that. Let's just assume that Paul's right when he's saying that childbirth is really hard. And to watch someone who's struggling with trying to return to legalism, right? Paul is like, I will struggle with you. I will pray for you. I am here for you. I want to see Christ formed in you. Oh, that all of us as believers would have that feeling about one another and about those who we disciple. What a testimony. What a testimony. So I want to give us just four things, four questions to ask ourselves as we consider, like, what it is to disciple others and even maybe about ourselves. Number one, are you focused on the goal? The goal is to see Christ formed. We aren't trying to win other people over to us, right, as believers. If, we, if you're on the path of of being in Christ and you are adopted as a child of God and you have forsaken legalism and forsaken your own way, if you're on that path, we aren't trying to win people over to us. We aren't trying to win people over to a political perspective, okay? Everybody agrees with that, right? There, there are certainly, honestly, I get it, like there are values inherent in certain viewpoints that do mesh over with values we see in Scripture, but we do not primarily try to win somebody over to a a platform of politics. We want to see Christ formed in people. If you're worried about whether or not Christ informed people, forming in people will change them, it will change them. You don't have to worry about that. So let's make that our focus instead of the secondaries. If you spend twice as much time, four times as much time, ten times as much time pleading with people to focus on Christ as you do throwing out politics, you'll be much better off. Do you get upset when somebody doesn't listen to you, right? Do you, do you want people to appreciate what you're doing, right? No, the goal is Christ formed in us. Also, have you experienced the change in life, right? If you're talking to somebody or discipling someone, is your own life shaped by Christ? Paul's was, and that's why we see Paul's like, hey, here's my example. I was with you. You've seen me live. You know what I'm like. You know that I've lived this out, right? But not of my own strength, of the grace of Christ. That's, that's for us. Have you experienced it? Ask yourself the question. Have I experienced life change? And would I be able to point those around me to saying like, hey, you've seen me. You've seen how Christ is primary in my life. Third, are you passionate about it? Do you have an urgency and intensity like Paul? Are you laboring over anyone else's spiritual transformation? Can I, let me throw a challenge out to us. If in the past month we've not prayed for anyone to either respond to the gospel or we've not prayed for anyone we know who's a believer, to grow in Christ, I feel like we can do better, right? Not that we're earning anything by doing better, but I feel like maybe, maybe in the next week, let's earnestly pray and labor over someone that we know that might be far from God, that Christ would be formed in them, and that we might have an opportunity to be a, a mouthpiece for the gospel. And lastly, are you convinced of God's ability over yours? Truth is, some people will look up at somebody who's preaching here and be like, well, I could never do that. I could never share the gospel. I could never, I could never do the things that that person is doing, right? I'm not winsome. I'm not, not that I am, but I'm not winsome. I'm not, you know, I don't have all these qualities. I, there's, I'm just not built that way, right? Paul's whole point was we may think that we don't have the qualities to be someone who is discipling others or that God uses people who have certain types of personalities only or people who are winsome, articulate, cool, and appealing to the eye, but that's not how God works because it's not about us, right? It's about Christ. So you might be thinking, well, I'm not, this is not really for me. I'm not Paul. But the reality is God has placed you in the life of someone to labor over them, seeing Christ formed in them. 
And that is the most wonderful thing that we could ever experience, is not only to be saved, but to be drawn into the process of pointing other people to Jesus. It's so amazing. Scott McKnight says this, our perceptions of whom God uses can thus become a disgusting typification of cultural values rather than perceptions rooted in biblical values and traditions. There is someone in your life whom God has placed you in relationship with and given you the opportunity to seek Christ being formed in them. Are you hesitating, thinking that you are unskilled, unimportant, or unworthy? Or are you trusting God, praying for that person, walking with that person, and pleading with that person that they might set their eyes firmly on Jesus Christ? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you this morning for your word. <clears throat> Lord, I pray that we would never forsake it and that we would never fall into believing that there's some way, shape, or form that we can add better things to what you've already told us. Father, I pray that we would be firmly entrenched in trusting in you, trusting in your power, trusting in your spirit, trusting in the finished work of Christ, trusting in your word to make us complete Lord, able to accomplish all that you've set aside for us to accomplish, all that you have planned, all that you have ordained. Father, I pray for us this morning that we might never be uh, tempted to seek our own way to you, but instead, Lord, we would joyfully submit ourselves to Jesus Christ. Father, I pray if there's anyone in here this morning that has never trusted in Christ, that they might begin to ask questions, Lord, and feel drawn to call on the name of Jesus for salvation. Lord, we love you, and we celebrate your amazing grace. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.